Welcome back. Well, let's get talking to a couple of other companies. Sinjin reported what was a weak set of Q1 numbers. The margin uh, was lower. The EBITDA was lower as well on a year-on-year -year basis. To decode this, we have Jonathan Hunt, who's the MD and CEO of Sinjin, who's joining in. Mr. Hunt, thank you very much for taking the time out. Uh, you know, I wanted to start by asking you not about the margins, but about the U.S. biotech business, because you have indicated that there are continued challenges within that space at this point in time. Uh, but last quarter, I remember you had said that there are some kind of green shoots of recovery. So um, what is the situation now? Has that not panned out as per expectations? Is there still a funding challenge uh, which has impacted one of your verticals this quarter? Oh, yeah, super question. Um, I, I go, take a step back. If you have a look, the U.S. biotech sector, uh, particularly where it's funded by sort of uh, venture capital, private equity capital coming into it, has had a really tough 18 months or so. It had boomed over the last decade uh, and running into the pandemic, then accelerated even more during the pandemic. So during the pandemic years, we were having double the normal flow of capital going into U.S. biotech. Um, and then as we came out of the pandemic, it dipped. It went to a much lower level, I think, as the rest of the global economy uh, reawakened and opened up, and therefore capital had more choices to go to. What I was trying to in indicate last uh, quarter, and actually during the second half of last year, is we were starting to see a rebound and a rebuilding of new capital flows into U.S. biotech. So this is around uh, biotech companies in the U.S. ability to raise new uh, venture capital, new funding to drive their science forward. And what we saw in the last quarter was that's back at pre-pandemic levels. Numbers I saw were about 23 billion US dollars of new investment going into the biotech sector. And that's a positive, healthy indicator for companies like us, because as they raise new capital, they then take a time to decide how they're going to deploy it, the sort of experiments that they're going to do. And then that starts to drive a pickup in demand. And that really is the, the, the sort of macro background trend hmm. to the guy given the Sinjin shape of the year. We, we said it, we would think it was going to be flattish revenue growth in the first half, both quarter one and quarter two. And then we expected to see a strong pickup towards the uh, end of the year and in the second half. As that new capital that's being raised now in the US starts to be spent and starts to create demand in the services industry in the second half of the year. So I think for me, at least the story of our quarter is as expected. It was a soft quarter, but we predicted it. And it's in line with our thesis that we think there's some very positive longer term indicators and they indicate good growth in the second half of the year. All right. So that, uh, you know, so should one assume that there is no change to the guidance that you've given as expected was the first quarter, no problems with, uh, you know, the margins and uh, even the revenue growth that you have for the entire year, the first half, Correct. of course, understandably weak, right? Yeah, absolutely. If anything, I mean, it, it, a soft quarter, but it does tell us at least our understanding of what's going on in the broader market. What's happening in demand was accurate. We predicted it in line with the analyst expectations. That means the market understood that this was the shape of the quarter to expect in the first, you know, the first quarter and the first half of the year. Um, and so no change to guidance. We, we think we'll return to growth in the second half. We think we'll grow overall on revenue for the full year. We think the margins will now start to come uh, back up. We've given guidance in uh, you know, EBITDA margins similar to last year's on a full mm. year basis. So you start to see that operating leverage come back into the business sequentially through the year. And if you do a triangulation, it must mean quite a robust second half of the year when it uh, comes to but but uh, Mr. Hunt, won't the margin climb be a uh, be quite an uphill task? Three quarters to get to the FI twenty four odd levels because you are at around twenty one percent on a reported basis this quarter, and that yeah. was the key disappointment this time round uh, because last quarter was around thirty percent plus in terms of margins. Uh, so how how do you expect the margin trajectory? to pan out in three quarters for you to get to those levels? I, I, I think it's implicit in the guidance. We think, you know, on a full year basis, we'll be back up in the high 20s at the EBITDA level. Uh, we think profit will grow single digits. And we think that uh, on a full year basis, revenue will grow high single digits to uh, low double digits. 
And after that, it's just math. You can triangulate from where we are to achieve that full year performance, predicts for sequential improvement in those margins and a recovery in the second half. Uh, it looks like the street is actually putting in that math because, you know, as you stick to your guidance, even as you know, there was a soft first quarter, uh, the street was worried whether you would, you know, scale down that, uh, scale down on that guidance or not. But now that you're confident, maybe we're seeing a bit of an uptick on the stock price as well. So soft quarter, no worries. The next couple of quarters would see some recovery. What about the other two verticals? I mean, dedicated centers and uh, the biologics manufacturing. How has business been out there and what's your prognosis here? Yeah, it's good. I mean, the dedicated centers is, you know, very solid. We've got 27 years of a relationship with uh, one of our dedicated centers. So things don't change very much on a quarter on quarter basis. So very happy with what was a solid performance in the dedicated centers. Uh, and I think the biologic CDMO part uh, of the business has been a super success. If you look at where we've come over uh, the last five years from being a pretty much a new entrant in Biologic CDMO. We're now in sort of version two, avatar two of that that, that sort of organization's life with the acquisition we did last year uh, of a, a plant from Stellus. We're in investing and upgrading. We're getting that qualified. It's all on track. So that mm. will become operational towards the end of this financial year. And that's the point we can take it to the market, start showing it to customers, and start the sales process. But it, it gives us super headroom. For growth, which was really the strategic problem, we we'd run out of capacity. We'd sold everything that we had uh, installed, and therefore we were in danger that we would have to turn clients away. By making that decision to acquire rather than to build, we bring forward the capacity by a couple of years. And uh, once once the sort of upgrading and the qualifications finished, back out into the market becomes a, a sales opportunity. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the U.S. business uh, because, you know, you do, besides the biotech funding piece, you also have the U.S. elections and the possibility of a biosecure act which could come into play. Uh, what is your sense in terms of how much of an opportunity that is presenting to be? Because uh, you have indicated that you all are seeing queries uh, when it comes to the China plus one factor. Has that culminated into anything tangible and what can we expect? Is there any all also, is there any risk to uh, to the business from the U.S. elections? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I actually think the issue is more fundamental than just a piece of U.S. legislation. By the way, the Biosecure Act had uh, bipartisan support, so it, almost to some extent, depending on which party wins the next election, they both indicated so far that they support that direction of travel. But I think the learning is a bit deeper. You have to go back to the pandemic and just look at uh, how people re-examine their supply chains. So it's not particularly uh, an issue just of one geography uh, being the issue. It's about over-reliance on any particular element of your supply chain. If you have all your eggs in one basket, you have a resilience issue. So I think the opportunity for us as a company, and I think more broadly for India um, uh, uh, as a destination for this work, is that those lessons, the pandemic, plus the, the geopolitics, geopolitics that are enshrined in the Biosecure Act, are prompting uh, our clients around the world to think very deeply about, do they have too much reliance or too much exposure to any one particular region of the world? Now, there are some super firms in China that really do do good science and good service. But if, all the, all the, if everything's in one place, you don't have that resilience. So what we've seen so far this year is a real step up in the number of client audit teams, of client visits, where they're just coming to see what we've got to offer. Uh, and right. they're giving, and that's, turn, that's turning into pilot projects, which is really, I think, the theme for us and most of the Indian CRO, CDMO industry this year, testing particular services, and that then sure. if, can scale up. All right, uh, Jonathan, we're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us. So that is Sinjin sticking to their FI25 guidance, and that's probably what the street likes. Stock is up around 3 odd percent. We'll take a short break. More on the markets. Uh, we'll also speak to uh, IGL to decode their Q1 numbers. Stay tuned.